Welcome, everyone. Um, appreciate you staying late on a Thursday uh, this far into the con. Great to see familiar faces out there. Um, just a little bit about me. So my name is Ryan Burnett. I'm the director of SecOps over at Pluralsight. I've been at Pluralsight a couple years now. Um, a little bit about my experience. Um, I did seven years as a DOD contractor doing IT, networking, security uh, for the Air Force, and then uh, spent five years redeeming myself after working for a company that kills people, uh, working in healthcare uh, for five years. Uh, and then uh, the past seven years, I've been working here in Utah around Silicon Slopes, uh, building security programs, uh, a lot of startups and companies here. So this isn't my first rodeo. I've done this uh, security thing quite a few times. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Some of my hobbies uh, are my family. I guess that's a hobby. My kids keep me busy. I like to listen to and make music. Uh, I like to sing, uh, play instruments. Uh, I like to watch Netflix and chill, like really <laughs> watch Netflix and chill. I like to watch documentaries on Netflix uh, and uh, other streaming services. And then uh, I like to read when I can, and then uh, I really like video games. I'm an old-time gamer. Started out with Command & Conquer, uh, moved up to some other first-person shooters and realized that I suck really bad, and went back to RTS and strategy games. Um, and then uh, in my spare time, when I, when I can, I like to MacGruber some Bash scripts together. I like Bash because it's already on the machines. You don't have to install stuff to get it to work. And it just, it works. So Bash is my scripting language of choice. Um, first of all, I want to start out and give some credit. Uh, I attended a Black Hat training this year. Uh, first time ever going to Black Hat. Uh, the training I attended was an active defense training given by Black Hills Information Security, uh, John Strand. Excellent instructor. I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, but I learned a lot of these concepts and things I'll be talking about today added a little flair of my own to it uh, with my own experience. But definitely want to give a shout out to them and these awesome people that uh, put this together. So those that know me will know that sometimes I don't have a filter and sometimes some, uh, some swear words might uh, come into my talk. So these are the Utah County swear words that might slip in uh, to my talk today. So I apologize ahead of, ahead of time. I was told I have to actually say these like a Utah. So if I say fetch or fetchin or fetcher <laughs> or flip or flippin, uh, freak or frick, crap, shiz, shizola, shut the front door, <laughs> and then what the fom fom, that's one of my favorites to say, and uh, chappy, it basically means bozo, right? It means bozo to me. <laughs> Nobody else. Okay, so I've heard dark mode is all the, the rage right now, so let's go ahead and Flip over to dark mode. So this is what you're all here to see. Um, if you can't tell, um, I've got some uh, Harry Potter theme going on here uh, with the defense against the dark arts. I like Harry Potter. I'm not a huge fan, but I like it enough uh, to glean some security uh, information from watching the movies. I don't know if you've ever watched the movies and put a security lens on it, but you can learn a lot from uh, Harry and the gang. But let's dive into it. I'm going to be talking a lot about blue teams. Uh, what we have to do as a blue team is a defender. Uh, a lot of our struggles that we deal with. And then, uh, yeah, let's have fun. So, being on a blue team as a defender, hopefully we got some blue teamers here. Do you ever feel this way? Do you ever feel like you're picked on? <laughs> like, please don't hurt me. You get an assessor, a red team that comes in, and just pones your shiz. They just come in and own everything, and you're just like, guys, come on, please don't hurt me. Or maybe, as a blue teamer, you're just panicking inside all the time. You've got that inner uh, voice that just... <laughs> or uh, sticking with the Harry Potter theme, as a, as a blue teamer, I feel like we do need to practice uh, the dark arts. We need to understand them. Now, we can't use them. Uh, that's illegal. Uh, but we need to understand their tactics. Uh, but sometimes, maybe as a blue teamer, you may think that the job is jinxed a little bit. 
that uh, you can't really win sometimes. Like this guy ended up with his memory wipe. This guy's dead. This guy's dead. He resigned and then later died. And then he's dead and she's in prison. <laughs> Um, so as I was watching the movies and I'm looking at these Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers, I'm like, man, that's a bad rap. That stinks. Um, maybe as a blue teamer, sometimes you're just totally terrified to where you can't even move. You're scared stiff, uh, Petrificus totalis. Uh, but there are all kinds of courage. Uh, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. Do you remember Neville standing up to Harry Hermione and, uh, Ron, and they, <laughs> they politely uh, freeze him. He's wearing blue pajamas, by the way, blue team. Uh, he's trying to defend. Um, but sometimes, as a blue teamer, uh, we have to stand up to our friends. That could be the IT team, that could be our executives, our users. And we have to stand up and be like, no, that's not what we need you to be doing. Um, so, speaking of Neville, this is Neville now. It's looking great, right? Way to go, Neville, right? So we need to get some of that Neville confidence, <laughs> okay? He's looking good. So let's, let's be like Neville Longbottom. Let's have some uh, bravery, some confidence. Uh, let's make blue teams great again. Okay, I can't do a, can't do a good impression, but um, this isn't a political talk. <laughs> it's not, uh, but I just love this picture of Trump here. Like, somebody took the time <laughs> to put a mini gun in his hand and an eagle. Um, but let's make blue teams great again. Let's get some confidence behind us. Um, one problem that we're seeing is what I like to call seagull security. Like you get an assessment or an auditor or a red team and they come in just like a seagull and they swoop in, they come in, they make a lot of noise, <laughs> they shiz all over everything and then they fly away. <laughs> and they don't have to deal with the aftermath of the assessment or trying to fix it or taking the next 12 months, two years trying to put a program in place that'll address all the things that they found, right? Pretty sweet gig, if you ask me. So I love red teams. We need red teams. Uh, I have a lot of red team friends. But this style of coming in as a red team, it, it's just, it's not helpful, right? We, we need a better way. So what can we do when we face off against our enemy? What can we do when it's either a real attacker or a red team or an assessor coming in? First of all, let's make their jobs harder. Let's not make it easy on them, okay? They come in, they break stuff, they fly away. Well, let's make it hard. Let's make them cry tears of frustration uh, when they stumble on our networks, okay? So I don't know if any of you guys have ever d jumped hurdles. Let's put a lot of hurdles in for them to jump over. Um, there's a reason there's not a 1,600-meter hurdle in track and field, because hurdles suck, and they're really hard, and you get tired real quick. And that's what we want. We want these red teamers, these assessors, these attackers to get tired and move on to the next guy. That's the whole point of this talk, there's not one thing in here that is a silver bullet that's going to protect you. You have to do all these things, and we're just trying to wear them down, okay? So whenever we talk about uh, doing active defense, it always comes up that hacking back. Uh, right now, uh, currently, hacking back is illegal. Uh, there's actually a law uh, being pushed through the House right now, a bill, uh, that's been there a couple of years or trying to push it through, but it would allow people to hack back if they're under attack, okay? But currently, right now in our political landscape, it is illegal to hack back. So don't, I'm not going to talk about it too much, but that is an option. Um, but believe it or not, criminals, they have rights too. You're not allowed to hack back. And remember, it could be, it could be Grandma Ellen's computer that the attacker is using to hit you, so you're really just hurting Grandma Ellen. Okay, uh, back in the, the old days with prospectors, they would put uh, in the 1840s and the gold rush, they'd put shotguns in sheds, and if someone came into the shed to open and steal their gold and kill them or maim them, right? That's illegal. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't put shotguns behind doors, and it's, it's indiscriminate is the problem. 
that anybody that opens that door, and if it's a fireman and the shed's on fire and they come in to put it out, they get shot in the face with buckshot. That's not okay. So that kind of stuff, that mentality of, well, they did it to me, I'm going to do it to them, that's not okay. All right? So legal, legal things aside, let's talk about where is the line. Uh, so if things are illegal and things are legal to do, what can we do? So we're going to draw the line right in the middle here of running commands on the attacker's machine. If you're running commands on their machine, you're pretty much over the line. You're on that illegal side. I'm not going to say you're all the way to the red, but you're pushing it. So let's stay a little bit off of that line, and let's do things that are being used right now uh, by marketing departments. Uh, they do things like use trackers, and they put pixels on things, and they track and get geolocation, and they have all these data elements and points about you, and they know exactly who you are. So let's start using those tactics and find out who's attacking us. Let's get a little bit of attribution. It's really hard to get like definite attribution, but if we know who is attacking us, then we can prepare our defenses accordingly, okay? So first thing, let's get our shields up. Remember they put that shield around Hogwarts? Let's get our shields up. There's some things that we have to do that are prerequisite. Number one thing that I want to talk about is just taking back the desktop. Um, you got to know what's on your network. You got to know what devices are there, what software is running. Uh, you, you have to have a hardware and software inventory. If you look at the CIS controls, the first 20 questions are about inventory. Okay, so know what's on your network. Know where your critical data is on your network. Okay. If I came to you and said, where's your critical data, you might be able to point me a few servers, but what about your corporate data, your HR data, your legal data, uh, all your customer data? You gotta know where that is. Also, you gotta control your endpoints. There's a reason that users are called users and not called admins. Admins uh, have admin rights. Users have user rights. Uh, don't give your users Admin rights, if you can help it. Now, I know there's going to be exceptions. There's times you got to, and they got to install the thing and do the other thing. And also, it's the culture, and nobody wants to upset people. Uh, but let the users run at a user level, and then elevate when they need to install stuff or change things or configuration or your devs need to do stuff. Like, let them elevate up there and then go back down. So day to day, they're running as a user. Okay? That's huge. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of trends where we just hand a laptop to people and say, good luck, call me if it breaks. And that doesn't work out too well. Uh, also, we need to turn on monitoring and do central log collection. How many of you actually collect logs on your endpoints? A few? Good for you. How do you do it with your remote employees? It's a little harder, right? They're out on the internet, they're road warriors. How do you get those logs, those security logs that we care about that we can tell somebody's on their box? How do we get those back into our sim? Uh, warning banners, um, terms of use, policies. You have to have policy. If you don't have policies, you have no teeth. Like, people are just not going to listen to you. And when they break the policy that's not written down, you have nothing to do. You, you have no recourse, okay? So you have to have policies. Um, you got to get your house in order. You got to patch your systems. This seems basic, but it's, it's not happening and where we're not doing it soon enough. Uh, a lot of these vulnerabilities that we're seeing are because of people not patching their systems. We see these giant breaches because people aren't patching. S are you scanning your web apps? Are you scanning your OSs on your network? All of them, endpoints, servers. Are you doing authenticated scans? Probably not, maybe. Are you scanning for third-party applications, Office, Adobe, Flash? that shouldn't be out there, other things. Um, but you gotta know where your data is, you gotta be able to protect it. Also treat your uh, internal network as hostile. There's this concept of zero trust. Uh, your users, if, if you hand them a laptop and they're using it for Minecraft and World of Warcraft and who knows what, or their kids are using it, or their husband's using it, or their wife, we don't know what they're putting on there. So we gotta treat them as hostile. Segmentation, uh, some people think that segmentation means, oh, 
10 dot X is over here and 10 dot Y is over here. That's not segmentation, that's subnetting. Segmentation is ACLs. Actually having blocks so the computer at one end of your company can't talk to a computer at the other end of the company or one end of the state, the other end of the state. Actually having things in the middle that block it. A lot of people have flat networks. I've seen them. <laughs> they're flat as can be and they're like, we have subnetting, we're good. No, ACLs, firewalls, uh, VLANs. Also, this helps if you do get attacked or, attacked or when you do get breached, it protects you and it makes the blast radius, the cleanup and containment and all that much smaller. Okay, so when people argue about, against segmentation, say it's going to help us when we get breached, the blast radius. Okay, um, and then lastly, like just expect to be breached. Anything less nowadays is just denial. It's happening left and right. Um, just with all of the, we could have supply chain uh, vectors, people putting chips on things that we didn't know were there. Uh, you just, just expect it, right? All right, let's talk for a minute about a little formula that I learned. Uh, so this formula is the detection time plus the reaction time must be less than the attacker's time to their goal for you to win. Okay, if it's, le if it's greater than, if it takes you longer to detect or to react to that attacker, you're going to fail. So we're all about making them take longer with active defense. We're, we're trying to make them take longer to reach their goal. That's the whole point. We probably won't stop them if they're motivated or a nation state, but most people, we can stop them and make it take longer, right? Don't make it easy on them. So Sun Tzu... Uh, philosopher said that all war warfare or cyber warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are unable to attack, we must seem unable. When we're using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we're near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away, and when far away, we must make them believe that we are near. Okay, these tactics, these warfare tactics, they apply to what we're seeing today in our war, our battle. So, if you cannot detect an insider on your network, your network is not secure. Okay, the days of having a great perimeter and that's all you need, those days are gone. Because they hop on a VPN and they're writing your network. Or they get credentials and they're right into the cloud where all your data is. Okay, so having a perimeter just doesn't cut it anymore. We still need a perimeter, don't get rid of your perimeters. <laughs> still need them. But we gotta be able to detect insiders. Most attackers do not practice any kind of defense. They're the, they're the predator. We're the prey. Okay? So they are coming after us and they're going to use the same tools that we use on our network because they want to get to the things on our network. They're going to use Windows or they're going to use ActiveX or JavaScript or whatever our site is that they're trying to exploit. They need to run those. Okay? So they have to tur turn off antivirus. They have to get rid of tools. Also, security is hard. They're lazy, they don't want to deal with that. So just know that a lot of these attackers that are hitting us, they don't have any security, okay? All right, there's a concept in active events of poison versus venom. So poison is something that has to be ingested. It has to be, it's something that you can like sit on the shelf, it's passive. It can be deadly or have nasty consequences when you ingest poison, but they have to take it and ingest it. Okay, think of like the mandrake poison potion or the drought of living death from Harry Potter. Um, then on the venom side, these are the three unforgivable, unforgivable curses that they talk about. Uh, in order for these curses to work, you had to have malice. Otherwise, you just kind of screwed people up. But so they're active. You're attacking. They're deadly. Right? There's malice behind it, like they did it to me, I'm going to do it to them, attack back. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about venom, we're going to talk about poison. Okay? So, what are some things that we can do to poison our network against attackers? We want them to take their ball and go home. We want hurdles. Okay? So, let's take some concepts from the military and warfare, and things like deception, subterfuge, misinformation. How do we make it confusing when they get on our network, okay? How do we set up traps, decoys? 
How do we use camouflage or smoke screens to our advantage? Maybe mines or claymores. You gotta be careful. I wanna blow your own fingers off with those. So maybe we set up on our network, we put pointers directing them where to go, breadcrumbs. A little trail of files or accounts or things that maybe we even open doors for them. As they come in, they'll just naturally go this way. They're going to follow these signposts. Okay, but what if we could actually make them move to where we wanted to go? What if we could be like these staircases in Harry Potter where, oh, you thought you were going over there, but now you're going over here. You start scanning my box, now I'm going to move you to this subnet, and you're locked in over here, and you have access to hardly anything, right? Start thinking about these kind of concepts. Also, traps. If, if you were going to walk through a minefield, how differently would you behave as an attacker? If you knew to get to that target, you got to go through a minefield, you're going to be a lot more deliberate, a lot more careful. You're going to slow them down, okay? It's that detection time, and the that we got to get to the, our goal before they get to theirs, okay? So, smoke screens. Maybe a little more effective than that, but... Um, <laughs> the military uses smoke uh, when they want to move. When they want to move, uh, they, they use it offensively and defensively. Uh, it can also be used to signal for exfiltration or a target. They throw smoke out there. So, we need to use smoke to kind of hide what we're really doing. What if, what if your Slack or your email is part of the compromise and the attackers are watching everything you're saying about the incident in your Slack and your email, right? Do you have an out-of-band method to communicate? Uh, think about how we can hide what we're trying to do from the attackers. And segmentation works great for this kind of stuff. Also, uh, security through obscurity. This one, this one I, I used to look at this and be like, yeah, security through obscurity, that's stupid. That doesn't work. Actually, it's very effective. It's slowing them down. Think about where's Waldo, okay? If you had to pick a server out of a hundred servers that look like garbage, <laughs> it's going to be a lot harder to do. Security through obscurity can work to slow them down. It cannot be the only thing you do. You got to do all the other things, okay? But it can be effective. Um, if you're a red teamer and you come into a network that is just looks like garbage, <laughs> you're going to cry. You're going to you're going to cry lots of tears. And those tears from red teamers make the finest wine. Okay, that's a quote directly from John Strand. So, um, so if we can use subterfuge and misinformation, what if we put things like when you're doing OSINT, uh, when you're doing recon on a company, one of the first places you do is you go to Google, type in the company, do a who is, do a LinkedIn, start looking. LinkedIn is rife with information. Like we got people that put, hey, I'm a sysadmin over at such and such company, and I know Active Directory, and I know Exchange, and I know O365, and, and now you know all the technology that they use at that company. So have you ever thought about putting some fake profiles out on LinkedIn? for a sysadmin or an intern that doesn't know better. <laughs> Put some fake information, misinformation out there. Fake DNS entries to interesting servers. Put those on your network. Try to get people to go off down a rabbit hole and waste their time. Okay? Don't make it easy. So, if I give you a list of servers, can you find which ones are critical? Just by looking at the names. And I've seen these in my career. <laughs> People name their servers. UT FinServe 01, Jenkins 5, Dash Win. I can learn a lot just by looking at the host name of a box, right? First one's a finance server in Utah, one of many. It's 01, they must have an 02, right? App server running 2016 R2, web server running Debian. Marketing Tableau 04, it's a cluster. Right? Utah Firewall of one, main firewall. They probably have more than one. APAC, VPN, O3, Asia Pacific. See how much information you can get just from the name and where your targets are? So why, why do we do this? Why do we name our things? Why don't we use things like, use planets, name your server Centauri, or use Bill and Ted references. Call it Rufus as your file server 
or Snoopy or Red Five. I don't know, pick some sci-fi thing that all the geeks know and they know which server it is. They log into Snoopy every day, right? But let's not make it easy on attackers, okay? A couple of things. Uh, there's a product, and I'm going to get into a few little tools here that you can use. Uh, Sysmon, this is by Sysinternals. And Sysinternals gobble up by Microsoft, and everybody thought they were going to go the way the Dodo, but they left them alone for the most part. Sysinternals has been a great uh, batch of tools. Um, there's one called Sysmon. If you're not using this on your Windows servers, please go check it out. But it lets you do all sorts of monitoring of network connections, processes, kick it out to logs, and then snarf those up in your sim. Another tool uh, is called AppLocker. It's crazy effective. It comes as part of Windows. And basically, it's a GPO that you turn on. And you can do it by file path. You can do it by program name. You can do it by MD5 hash to whitelist or blacklist applications from running on, on your servers. A couple other things. Uh, in your WAF, why don't you create a rule that just automatically blocks Nikto or Akinetics or Burp? Why, why do you need to allow those things to come in through your WAF? Just block them and watch them cry and cry <laughs> about why they can't connect. And you're like, huh, I don't know what's going on. Maybe you guys should try harder. Um, they don't think about this stuff. They don't think to change the agent string. They just use the defaults and they go right through. Um, here's a little uh, script uh, written in Bash, of course, um, where basically I call scan to ban. But if you run this script in a screen, it will sit there and listen on your network connection. And anything sent to port, you can make it whatever, anything sent to port gets automatically added to a block list in IP tables. You want to watch a red, red team cry <laughs> themselves to sleep at night? Start blocking them whenever they scan you. Just turn this on. Okay, now take this script, use it. Um, if you want to make it cool, like add some logic in there to say, okay, well, I don't just want one port. Let's say if they hit 10 ports or 50 ports or whatever, then add them. Or let's only run it at a certain time. Or just go crazy. Add it as a, as a cron job or a screen. Um, maybe even go in and make it so your Nessus scanner doesn't trigger this. You don't want to lock yourself out. But think about the things that we can do to make their lives miserable, okay? Um, also, honeypots. Um, there's some good ones out there. Kippo is now called Calry or Calry. Heard it pronounced both ways. Uh, but this is a really good honeypot. You can run it in a Docker. Uh, you can get people to connect in. Uh, the smart ones will learn pretty quick that they're in a honeypot, but now, by now they've already triggered, right? You're, you should be monitoring your honeypots. Don't just set them out there. Like, actually have them send logs, send alerts back to your SIM. If you don't have a SIM, use email, something. One cool thing is that they stay logged in even after they think they've left on some of these script kitties that don't know better. They think they've logged out, but they're not really logged out. You can sit there and watch them try and connect to other servers. And now you can see what, what else might be compromised on your network that they're trying to get to, right? It's really good. Honey tokens. Um, there's an open source tool called Open Canary. This is exactly the same as the Thinkst or Thinkist uh, Canary that you can buy for lots of money. But they have an open source version. It just doesn't have a GUI. But it has all the infrastructure. You can sprinkle Canary tokens throughout your network. Set these up, these things will beacon home, tell you when things, it's, it's also great for DLP and attribution. At least tell you that something's gone. It's a little alarm bell that goes off, okay? Honey accounts. This one's free and easy and cheap. Go into Active Directory, create some accounts that have access to zip, to nada, even go in and turn their logon hours to nothing, never, and leave them there. And then go into your SIM and say, if Fred Flintstone ever gets logged into, send me an alert. An, even an attempted login, right? This is easy, cheap. It might be the warning that you need that someone's on your network and trying to do a spray and pray uh, password spraying across the network. Also, honey records, you could put these in a database, uh, set up alerting on them. You could even set up a stored procedure that alerts when a uh, record gets accessed. Another tool I want to mention is called Honey Badger. So, 
few years ago, Google got in a lot of hot water because they were running around with their Google vans or Street View, and they were snarfing up SSIDs. And everybody was freaking out, okay? So Google said, okay, fine, we'll stop. We won't do it anymore. Well, guess what? They don't need vans anymore because everybody carries one of these in their pocket. And these things, when you turn on device location and tracking, they phone home, tell Google where you're at, and here are the SSIDs all around me. Okay, so as we're sitting here in this conference, your phones are pinging back to Google, saying there's a SyncCon network, and they know the geolocation of where that SyncCon network is. Don't use a Google phone. It does it on Apple, too. <laughs> it's not just Google. It's everybody. Everybody's doing this. Marketers love this stuff. They want to know where everybody is at all times and who you are and what age and demographic, everything about you so they can market you. Okay, they're using these technologies to market. Well, let's use these technologies to track people and get attribution. So the, the Honey Badger is really cool because if you have a Google API, you can just go sign up on Google uh, and get access to the API, and it will give you within a three meter radius of where someone is, okay? Especially if you've got tokens hooked up as well. Um, this one's kind of fun. So in... Microsoft world, you can create directories that link to themselves. So if you want to really mess with Durbuster <laughs> or some of these other tools that are crawlers through a, an OS, just make a directory that recursively points back to itself and then another one that points to that and they will just get in a loop. And a lot of times these guys just, they just run a little tool and they, they're like, yeah, this is going to take eight hours. I'm going to hit the hay. And they come back and they're just sitting there in a loop and they haven't even noticed anything, okay? Um, be careful with this, it could break your AV, um, but one thing I, I would love to, to know about ransomware, I'm assuming when you get ransomware on your machine, it either starts at the beginning or the end of the drive and it starts encrypting. If it hits this directory and tries to encrypt it, it might stop it, right? Someone test that for me. So, um, we had a website pop up that uh, somebody basically went out to our website, scraped the whole thing, and stood up a new domain and threw our website up there. And uh, it looked just like ours. It had the logo, had everything. Um, they even hot-linked the images from our server for theirs so they didn't have to host them, right? So what you could do with this is you could make an image or even a pixel and hide it that's on your box, and somebody copies your site, puts it up over here, you get a little alert. Hey, that's not coming from your domain. Somebody just cloned your site. And maybe you've got an active spear phishing campaign going against you now. A little bit of intel. So speaking of threat intel, um, a lot of people want to sell you threat intel, and they'll charge you Oh man, I've, I've heard up in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for their threat feeds and IP reputation and theirs is the best and they got all these sensors around the world. Well, that's all fun and good, but that's not directed at you. Those aren't direct threats at you. So the best thing to do is get your own threat intel, okay? Um, a lot of these lists, they're stale. They've been out there for years. They don't keep it up to date. They don't share because they want to sell it for lots and lots of money. So if you're getting, if you set up an infrastructure where you are getting your own threat intel out from the wild, wild west called dub, 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 um, you can now use that information of people actually attacking you and you can block real threats against your environment. What if you set up a threat intel environment like this where your public out on the internet is your dev and that's where people are attacking and you're getting all this information in this threat intel, and you pipe that over and feed it into your actual prod threat intel system, okay? Use the internet as like your testing ground and then go put that data to use and make sure that there's nothing calling out to those IPs from your own infrastructure, okay? So let's talk a little bit about some of the blue team pain points that we have. Um, so visibility and transparency so a lot of times blue teams uh, or infosec teams, they'll get buried in an organization. Um, it can be really hard when you don't have that transparency at the board level or the exec level. 
But information security is a boardroom discussion. If it's not happening at the board level, you're not gonna get the resources that you need, okay? So where the InfoSec org sits in an organization can make a huge difference. If you're buried under some, some department that is responsible for implementing all the controls that you're trying to do, and you're sitting under the, your peers with the IT team or with the ops team, and you're trying to get them to do things, it's real easy for that manager to be like, yeah, you know what, we got infrastructure to deal with, we got features to release, we gotta do lights on, like, ugh, we don't have time for this security stuff. Now, if you're in another department, and then it trickles up to that board level, the exec level, then they can start having discussions at that level about what they need to do. Okay, it's too easy for one person, one leader to just stifle that message that it doesn't trickle up. You need that transparency. So I've seen InfoSec, uh, about 50% of InfoSec departments report to the CIO. That's industry standard. About 35% report to the CEO, and then 15% about report to other. And other could be a COO or a general counsel. Uh, but take a hard look at where InfoSec sits in your org and whether it's working. It might, it might work for you, and that may depend on the personalities of the people involved on the teams, the leaders, uh, but if you're not getting anywhere, take a hard look at where you sit and maybe make a play to move to another org. Also, uh, to help you get resources, um, a lot of times if you report up through a CIO, through a CFO, well, guess what? The CFO, he cares about money, and he's going to say, well, that costs too much, and he's just going to ax it, right? right from the get-go. You don't even get to have the discussions. And then also, security is everyone's responsibility, so naturally everybody has an opinion about security. And when you have an opinion versus an opinion, whoever is the stronger personality is gonna win. If you take data with your opinion, you will win, okay? So make sure we have that data. So how do I get budget? How do I get my exec's attention? And then where should we report? So. First of all, avoid FUD. A good, a good amount of FUD can be helpful, but avoid like being chicken little all the time uh, in InfoSec. Uh, it, can, it can backfire, and then they start to just view you as the crazy man that always is paranoid about everything. Um, plan ahead. If you're not able to get the resources right now, if you're not able to get the money or the people, make a plan. So when a crisis happens or a breach or an incident, and they're like, oh man, what should we do about that? You can say, actually, in my back pocket right here, I've got a whole plan on how we can implement X, Y, Z. Okay, so you gotta be prepared. Because those opportunities will come, be ready, jump on it. It actually shows a lot of professional, uh, professionalism if you're ready to do that. And then also with the, uh, with the, risk, with the opinion versus data, there's something that we implemented uh, called risk scores. So executives, they know the language of business. They know the language of risk. They don't know InfoSec language. They don't know IT language. So we need to learn their language. They're not going to learn ours. <laughs> we need to learn theirs. Uh, and then also we need to train, an up, train them up. So on the risk score front, um, one thing we did was we boiled it down to three bubbles that they could wrap their head around. And we went from one to 100 and said, hey, this is our business risk, this is our product risk, and this is our privacy risk. And your, your bubbles might, might be different, but give them a score that they can look at, and it's a little bit more complicated than a stoplight chart, but give them something to look at to say, oh, that number's going up, or that number's going down, right? Give them something that'll help them, because they understand risk, they deal with it all the time, business risk, okay? So use something like that to talk to them. Also, another thing that worked really well for us uh, was we do incident response training for the executives. If you have an IR plan or an IR procedure, you should be practicing that at least a couple times a year. I'd say quarterly if you can. Get in with your execs and play Dungeons and Dragons, okay? And take in a 20-sided die <laughs> and some little figurines and nerd out with them for a little bit and put up a scenario Walk them through it. You're the dungeon master. They're rolling the dice. 
They can have fun, and they can learn, and you can practice your IR all at the same time. It's really cool. Um, one thing we did is we said, okay, if you roll 1 through 10, you failed. If you roll 11 through 20, you succeeded on that action, whatever that was. Now, if, someone's been do if it's been documented somewhere in a policy or a procedure, plus 5, automatically, boom. If somebody's been trained on it, plus 3, boom. So they could get a plus eight on every roll. Now, every so often, because I'm the dungeon master, I can say, man, minus nine, <laughs> okay? Because there are some things. You want to move the scenario along. You don't want them to just win every time, okay? Uh, another, another thing about that we've tried uh, for educating our execs and our users is internal bug bounties. Maybe create some for like OPSEC, create one for product bugs or privacy. Actually, maybe give them cash. Give them a gift card if they come back with a bug or an issue. Get your users that are typing admin, admin into everything. <laughs> Say, if you type admin, admin in a website, let us know and we'll give you 20 bucks. Right? And then we can go fix it. Put your users to work. Okay? Um, let's see, I've got a few minutes left. So, Having a roadmap really helps with your executives. They want to know that you've got this. They want to know, they want to be confident in you, in your team, in your abilities. So having a roadmap really helps. There's one thing we developed, and feel free to take pictures if you want. It's out on the internet as well. But executives love this kind of stuff. So if you're going to talk to your executives, you've got to make pretty slides, okay? You have to. Otherwise, they'll just ignore it. So if you take, this is called spider chart. And it, it might be hard to see, but we've got different legs and knee joints on this spider chart. And we took things like privacy, compliance, governance, defense, assessment, awareness, monitoring, product. And as you mature your program, you're going to start out kind of in that middle section there. And you're going to map and say, okay, well, I have policies and I have a DPA for all my customers. So let me move my, that leg out to there. And then what you do is you just kind of draw lines between those knee joints, and now you see what you have coverage. Then you can see where you have gaps. And then we kind of put different levels in here. So if you're a level one organization, maybe you're doing these things. Level two, you're doing a little bit more. Take this, modify it, use it for your own org, show it to your execs, they'll drool all over it. Uh, having a roadmap is key for getting that buy-in. So, real quick, uh, there was a documentary in 1990, it's pretty awesome, uh, about a brazen attack on this soft target, okay, that had one defender. That's it. The defender was able to use all the tactics that we talked about uh, to thwart these attackers. So this documentary, probably a lot of you have seen it. Um, it was Kevin McAllister in Home Alone he used all these tactics that we talked about to thwart the wet bandits that were trying to rob his home. So this is our house, just like Kevin. We need to know how to defend it. So he used smoke screens. He used <laughs> some tactics right in the face with an iron. Blowtorch, that might be, I don't know. That might be like a shotgun, I don't know. Firewall, there you go. <laughs> Same thing with the doorknob. And if you remember, he poured water on those front steps that froze, right? Because he didn't want them to come in the front door. He wanted them to come around the back door. We had more defenses in place. Like, lead your target where you want them to go. And then, uh, yeah, paint can to the face. So, just kind of wrap up. First, get your house in order. Do the things. There. There are things that we got to do. We all know it. Defense in depth. We've been talking about this, preaching about it for years. Uh, remember poison versus venom. Uh, venom is illegal. <laughs> Don't do it. Uh, but poison, we can definitely do. And if they come in and they drink that poison, that is on them. And put up the warning banners that say, hey, we have poison on our network. Right? Also, use these techniques, these defense techniques we talked about, and then build prepare, and if you're able to, build a robust InfoSec program. So now, go forth and conquer. Remember, our goal is to not make it easy on them, 
We want them to turn away, go through all the hurdles that it's not worth the effort or that we can catch them because we make them take too long to get to their target. So remember, let's make blue teams great again and go forth and spread the gospel of the blue team. And that is my presentation.